thank you to the organizers um, for inviting me here today. It's It's been really, really interesting and, and thought provoking to listen to many of the discussions. Um, thank you very much for asking me to talk. I'm the last speaker, which is a challenge, but uh, let's see where this takes us. Um, it has been it, it's been highlighted several times during the day that for a small state, um, the advantages of a rules based international society far outweighs the cost incurred by compromise. Um, Denmark is a small state. Um, the majority of states in the world actually are small states. So this is a condition that we share with with the many. In fact, for larger states, um, this is not so dissimilar. A rules-based international society it creates predictability. It provides legitimacy of action. It furthers economic development. Um, it can limit the cost politically, economically, and, and militarily of confrontation. And it can be an avenue of influencing and positioning. Um, when it comes to the Security Council, um, IHL is at the center of this rule-based international society. It's at the center of many of the most of the discussions taking place at the Security Council. In fact, last year, 31 of 54 Security Council resolutions contained IHL wording. And um, already the Danish campaign statement hi highlights quite rightly Den Denmark's long-standing support for IHL. At the same time, and as we heard um, several to times today, um, IHL and respect for IHL is, is challenged in many conflicts around the world. There has been a slimmer hope in, in Yemen um, accompanying the negotiations of a settlement and the recent exchanges of prisoners of war facilitated by the International Committee of the Red Cross. Yet eight years of conflict has left a devastated um, country with a very severe protection and humanitarian situation. In the Sahel, two million people are on the move as a consequence of violence. In Ukraine, we have seen the devastating impacts on the lives of millions of people, and the ICRC has several times called for IHL to be um, respected. When it comes to Tigray, I think we are yet to fully comprehend the scale of the protection crisis that has unfolded there. But nevertheless, I, I would venture the thought that um, to the 2022 escalation of the conflict in Ukraine has also brought some renewed support and attention to the importance of ensuring respect for IHL. I think it has changed the position and the posture of states, many of whom in the first two decades of the century saw IHL as a constraint and argued that it was outdated in its relevance to the war against terror, as it was called. The conflict in Ukraine and the great power competitions globally that we see right now has thus in some way led to a reaffirmation of the importance of IHL and I think it has created an opportunity for state leadership and for working with others to affect positive change. In response to the conflict in Ukraine, um, and as we heard earlier, Denmark has engaged with states and partners to ensure that perpetrators of international crimes are held accountable um, and have worked to refer the situation in Ukraine to the ICC. And without any doubt, accountability is important, but it comes after the act. Measures that focus on prevention, on implementation, and on addressing structural challenges, such as, for example, weak oversight systems, inconsistent change of command, or a lack of integration of IHL in procedures and training are equally essential to ensuring respect for the law and for mit to mitigating humanitarian consequences of conflict. During a potential Security Council seat, we hope that Denmark um, will ensure that a broader lens than accountability is 
applied to ensuring respect for IHL. There are many ways of working on this, and the, IH, the Red Cross has, has experience to, to draw from. Um, you can do this by implementing legislation, by influencing military doctrine and training, as we heard um, just before. You can work on oversight mechanisms. You can activate the powerful consensus, consensus around the Geneva Conventions in your partnerships, in your coalitions. You can improve the understanding of IHL as is happening here today. Um, you can work on and have the consideration towards how new technologies are implied in warfare and how they impact civilians. When violations do occur, remedial measures such as addressing systemic shortcomings, for example, the strengthening of command or the oversight structures, are also important as our victims' rights. I think there is very important learning to be had from Denmark's own military experiences. One place to start is by ensuring that the evaluations of 20 years of engagement in Afghanistan also includes an examination of to what extent Denmark had sufficiently prepared for its IHL obligations and whether this serosity of intention was sufficiently reflected in engagement with allies and partners. There are important lessons to be drawn from real experiences. This would also entail a serene look at how some thinking, many of you will remember this, this doctrine of civil military cooperation as it was designed at the time, how that affected the ability of humanitarian actors to take neutral, independent humanitarian action as is their role, and for some of them, their mandate under IHL. These are issues that have application also today, and we see in Ukraine that humanitarian action is blatantly politicized. We see how misinformation offline and online is jeopardizing humanitarian efforts to earn the trust and the acceptance of affected populations. There are false narratives around the role of humanitarian organizations, and these not only hamper our work, but they can create dangers for the people they are trying to protect and assist, and for our staff as well. We need states to speak up and to act effectively in support of independent, neutral humanitarian action, also when they themselves have so much at stake. I now want to dwell a little bit on the protection of civilians agenda. And without a doubt, over the time, the Security Council has addressed, addressed an increasing number of thematic issues. And in 1999, it added the protection of the civilians in armed conflicts to, to its agenda, recognizing it as a matter of international peace and security. This is an agenda that has expanded um, quite significantly over the years, and we now also speak about children in armed conflict and protection aspects of women, peace and security and so forth. Ensuring respect for IHL and the protection of civilians are intrinsically linked. And um, certain progress has been made on the normative and on the policy fronts towards the protections of the civilians. But the, the reality on the ground, as I also highlighted before, continues to tell a very different story. We see deliberate attacks on civilians and we see devastating impacts of armed conflicts on civilians in very many conflicts around the world. Together with and in support of movement partners, the Danish Red Cross um, look forward to engaging with the Security Council team towards ensuring that the protection of civilians' agenda is consolidated, that it is prioritized by member states and within the UN system, and that it remains at the core of country resolutions. And high on the list here, um, and an issue that is of particular concern to the protection of civilians, is the impact of explosive weapons in populated areas. Denmark has signed the political declaration on this issue um, in Dublin in last year in November. And it is an, a, a, a very good example of how incremental, but still an achievement to pr protect civilians can be made 
at policy and good practice level, even in an environment that is not conducive to international law development. Denmark can continue this path by working with states and partners and allies to connect the dots between wide area effects of explosive weapons in populated areas and how the damage caused to infrastructure and to civilian facility caused disruption to essential services on which civilians depend for their survival and lead to, to suffering amongst civilians. Being even more on these, more clear in these impacts and these connections, their causes and consequences can help ensure that the protection of civilians is a strategic priority in the planning and conduct of all military and security operations in populated areas. I also want to address the approach to fragility and um, this is an issue at the core of Danish international strategy. And in its engagement to promote stabilization and peace build, building, Denmark, as do other states, relies on a governance structure in the country in question that can be supported and strengthened with an aim of reducing the fragility that we see in so many places and ensure that there's a protection of fundamental rights. At the same time, a growing number of states are subject to international isolations and sanctions. This is a challenge to stabilization efforts and to state building. One consequence, as far as we can see, or it seems, is an increase in the share of development funding that goes to multi multilateral agencies. Since 13, Denmark's multilateral assistance has more than doubled. And that means that a larger proportion, proportion of Danish aid is managed by Copenhagen and a less, lesser proportion is managed by representations in the field. One could argue that this limit, limits the, the local engagement and narrows the space for coordinated engagement through Danish strategic partners. We at the Danish Red Cross believe that there's a scope to develop a more strategic approach to these challenging contexts that both involves a framework for Danish engagement and at the same time addresses the need to mitigate some of the implicit political risks that are involved. We are engaging with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on this and with our civil society colleagues and we do believe that such a strategic approach has the potential to inform a Danish Security Council candidacy. And this also provides me a segue into speaking about the impact of sanctions on humanitarian action. It has become increasingly evident that sanction measures um, adopted by the Security Council and by states and, and um, and allies, allies have hampered and sometimes criminalized impartial humanitarian action. Security Council sanctions, we know they vary widely and they can range from economic and trade sanctions to arm embargoes, travel bans, financial and commodity restriction. Following a very sustained advocacy effort, the Security Council first adopted in March 2019, resolution 2462, which urged states to take into account the potential effects of these measures on exclusively humanitarian activities. The colleague from Norway spoke about the Security Council resolution adopted in December 2022, resolution 2664, which introduced a cross-cutting exemption for, for humanitarian action in UN financial sanctions related to asset freeze. We hope that Denmark, during a potential Security Council seat, can support a rapid implementation of Resolution 2664, perhaps even do so during the candidacy, so that states can establish humanitarian carve-outs in their domestic sanction systems, which is, of course, of equal importance, and in this way facilitate the speedy delivery of humanitarian assistance in areas of interest to the Security Council across the world. 
finally, um, and unavoidably, unfortunately, the impact of the climate crisis on international security will only be more present by the time Denmark hopefully might have the chance for a seat at the Security Council. Efforts to frame this agenda in the Security Council has been met with opposition, sometimes quite fiercely, by many member states and has been strongly contested. However, addressing the impact of the climate crisis is very close to the Danish identity. And as we have heard today, one should pick priorities that resonates with your identity and with your foreign policy. So we, we are quite confident that this will, no matter what I say here today, be on the agenda for, for Danish um, candidature, as it rightly should be. We look forward to engaging with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs towards identifying opportunities and cross-regional coalitions that can also ensure um, that the human security is also prioritized and that conflict-sensitive climate change adaptation and early warning and action in fragile context is at the center of some of these efforts through evidence-based policy discussions and stronger linking with other UN institutions. So wrapping up, we hope that the Danish approach to a rule-based international society will have IHL and the protection of civilians at its very center. And we keenly hope they will look for opportunities for underground impact. We look forward to engaging on a strategic approach to fragility that can inform the Security Council seat. And meanwhile, an effective means of addressing the negative impact of sanctions on humanitarian actors. Finally, we have no doubt that the protection of our natural, envi natural environment and addressing the climate crisis will be at the core of a candidacy. We are ready to support climate security efforts that have human security and conflict sensitive adaptation in focus. There are, there are decades when nothing happens. However, it seems we're living in weeks where decades happen. So there's a very strong risk that whatever I say here today will be outdated and irrelevant by the time we hit a Danish Security Council seat. This rapid pace of events and a, a severe international polarization will make it very difficult to make use of what little space there is for strategic priorities. However, when Denmark last evaluated its membership in the Security Council, the close contact with civil societies and NGOs, often the only witnesses in conflict affected areas was highlighted as one of the, as one of the essential steps in solid analysis and preparedness. And we look very much forward to accompanying a seat once again. <laughs>